Ocean Steamship Company operated from 1872 to 1958, at which time its Savannah property was purchased by the Georgia Ports Authority. The Ports Authority intends to redevelop the track, located at the west end of River Street, and will demolish the last two remaining historic buildings. These include a 1915 headhouse and a 1910 water tower. This presentation is one part of a historical mitigation package to document the buildings. The Ocean Steamship Company was chartered in 1872 to provide passenger and cargo service between Savannah and New York. Traffic between North and South had been ongoing for more than a century. However, the cotton trade had a significant impact on the development of transportation during the 1800s. In 1793, Eli Whitney and his contributors developed the cotton gin, which resulted in a rapid increase of cotton production across the South. The new short staple cotton was grown extensively in the Piedmont regions away from the coast. To get the cotton to market, these areas required overland travel to reach inland ports like Augusta and Macon. From there, it would be shipped downriver and then to textile mills up north or in England. In the 1830s, the railroad emerged as a new way to connect inland areas with coastal ports. In Georgia, key antebellum railroads included the Central of Georgia, which terminated at Savannah, the Georgia Railroad, and the Western and Atlantic. In 1856, the Central of Georgia Railroad purchased stock in a New York-based steamer company called the Mitchell Line, and by 1859, it owned a controlling share. This allowed the Central of Georgia to interconnect its overland and maritime freight. But the Civil War halted further expansion of the Central's lines, and General William T. Sherman's march to the sea left much of its rail infrastructure in tatters. Demand for Southern cotton exploded after the Civil War and reignited the central of Georgia's desire for a comprehensive system of transportation. In 1872, the central purchased the New York-based Empire Line along with its six steamships for $600,000 in cash and bonds. Using the Empire Line ships, the central of Georgia established the Ocean Steamship Company in 1872. In 1874, the new steamship company was reorganized as a wholly owned subsidiary of the railroad. The new company was capitalized with $500,000, which was later increased to $1 million. The railroad's controlling interest allowed it to capitalize on a monopoly of New York to Savannah maritime traffic. The railroad also required its competitors to pay for use of its wharf spur lines and rented space for storage. In 1870, the Central of Georgia purchased 273 acres of the old Vale Royal Plantation west of the city of Savannah. For 100 years, this rice plantation had been owned by the McGilvery, Clay, and Stiles families and worked by enslaved Africans. After purchasing the property, the Central of Georgia intended to use it for spur lines and wharves. New terminal facilities were in place by 1872 and were transferred to the Ocean Steamship Company. A cotton press was completed in 1873. By the late 1870s, new sheds were constructed for guano and lumber storage. Because the lands were once part of a rice plantation, the property was essentially a swamp. It was bounded on the east by the Savannah and Ogeechee Canal, on the south and west by Central Georgia Railroad tracks, and was bisected by Musgrove Creek and a sewage canal. The creek served for drainage as well as an intake for the city of Savannah Waterworks. The new shipping berths and rapidly industrializing shoreline began polluting the city's water supply. As a result, the city relocated its waterworks two miles northwest at Hermitage Mills and sold its in-town property to the Ocean Steamship Company. The negotiations were conducted throughout the 1880s and included proposals to extend River Street, Bay Street, and Indian Street to the west. The initial deed also required construction of a 100,000 bushel grain elevator at the wharves. The old waterworks basins would later be filled and become the site of large cotton warehouses. Due to business growth, the Ocean Steamship Company expanded its terminal infrastructure throughout the late 19th century. In 1882, it transferred the Philadelphia ship operations, which were located downtown, to the new wharves. By 1884, a new slip housed the Philadelphia line. This slip was formed from the outflow of Musgrove Creek. To the southeast was a new set of large cotton warehouses. A new tram line connected River Street and the terminal. 
On the west side of the property, new lumber yards and tracks were constructed. The company used 150,000 cubic yards of dirt to fill the old waterworks basins where they installed a Gordon cotton press and new warehouses. In the late 1890s, the central of Georgia expanded its own wharves upriver and excavated a new slip for use by the Ocean Steamship Company. This required moving 600,000 cubic yards of earth and raised the old swampy plantation lowlands by six feet. The new slip included sheds on either side and new rail lines along the riverfront. For fire safety, the new design also placed cotton and naval stores on opposite sides of the slip. In 1876, the Ocean Steamship Company financed two new steamships, the city of Savannah and the city of Macon. Both could carry 3,000 bales of cotton and travel at a speed of 12 knots. These ships represented the first of several purchased by the company over the next 70 years. The company grew rapidly in the late 19th century. It operated lines to New York, Philadelphia, and eventually to Boston. Cotton was the principal northbound cargo. The company also installed a Gordon steam press at the wharves to compact bales to increase the amount that could fit into ship holes. In fact, in 1880, with 10,000 bales waiting at the docks, the company sent the new ship City of Augusta on its maiden voyage unfinished, and the carpets were installed on the return trip. Lumber and naval stores were also a valuable commodity. In 1875, over 9,000 barrels of turpentine and 41,000 barrels of rosin were shipped from Savannah. As the South recovered from the Civil War, its agriculture expanded beyond cotton into truck farming. Berries, oranges, cucumbers, peas, cabbage, and lettuce were shipped north in large quantities. In the 1890s, one Central of Georgia advertisement even noted that the Georgia peach had dethroned California fruit. By 1890, an estimated 2,000 men were employed at the wharves, and 1,500 hand trucks were used to move cargo to and from the ships. Between them, the Ocean Steamship Company and Central of Georgia Railroad were the largest employers in Savannah. Stevedores and dock workers were typically white immigrants or African American. Dock work could be incredibly dangerous, and newspapers often reported on serious injuries and even death. Strikes in the 1880s and 1890s were triggered by low pay, bad conditions, and sometimes the use of non-unionized labor. In 1891, African-American dock workers, who were often at the bottom of the pay scale, struck at the threat of having their pay cut from 15 to 11 cents an hour. In 1899 and again in 1920, strikes were prompted by the Ocean Steamship Company shifting workers, mostly African-Americans, to less desirable jobs. At the turn of the century, company employees were issued brass checks in lieu of payment on Fridays, but they could barter these checks to local merchants for advancements of money or merchandise. The company would then issue cash payment to whichever party presented the checks on Saturdays. The Ocean Steamship Company did not supply worker housing, but one newspaper article from the late 19th century suggested that many of the African American workers lived in the nearby Yamacraw district. For passenger service, the ships offered luxury accommodations of staterooms, dining rooms, saloons, and bathrooms. Advertisements would specify if cabin or steerage rates were available. Accommodations below decks lacked embellishments. They were cramped and sometimes forced passengers to intermingle with the crew. These areas were also segregated by race and sometimes gender. By the turn of the century, the company heavily promoted its fleet as the gateway to summer in the wintertime particularly as Florida became a popular destination. During the early 20th century, passenger service declined. Steamers had once been a novel and luxurious way to travel, but business and vacation trips were increasingly made by car. The company would sometimes offer cargo space for a fee for personal vehicles. During the 1920s, the collapse of the travel industry in Florida and the prohibition of alcohol also impacted passenger travel. Still, the company tried to keep pace by offering private bath facilities, orchestras, electric fans, hot and cold running water, and other onboard entertainment. Advertisements suggested the ships offered shuffleboard, quoits, ping pong, 
and somehow even golf and horse racing. This briefly boosted passenger traffic, but by the Great Depression, service had dropped significantly. By 1900, the Port of Savannah had become the third largest cotton port in the United States and the primary shipping point for all naval stores. The Ocean Steamship Company continued modernizing its fleet of ships to accommodate more cargo, which in turn required upgraded terminal facilities. At the time, all cargo was loaded by hand trucks through cargo ports on the sides of vessels, with larger bulk items lifted via cargo booms into hatches. During a 1903-1904 redevelopment of the property, the old grain elevator, shown in the top photograph, was removed. This allowed for relocation of tracks to a new wharf and space for additional sheds. The old Philadelphia slip was extended 240 feet inland. Further upstream, a new perpendicular slip was constructed by 1904, and another slip, along with supporting warehouses, was authorized in 1909. After this expansion, and including agreements with other entities along the waterfront, the Ocean Steamship Company had nearly one mile of frontage and 26 steamer berths. The Ocean Steamship facilities were considered some of the largest and most complete along the South Atlantic seaboard, and these added facilities were anticipated to accommodate more foreign trade and more efficient handling of materials. With warehouses loaded with cotton, lumber, and naval stores spread across the property, fire was a constant threat. Newspapers routinely reported on fires, both large and small. In the late 19th century, the company employed four night watchmen and funded a city-employed police company who were also trained as firemen. This company included a chief, three sergeants, and 16 privates to promote round-the-clock protection for both fire and theft. In 1882, the city allowed the company to have fire alarm telegraph wires extended to the wharves. Older Sanborn maps show piping and fire alarms throughout the property, along with a brick reservoir and water tower near the grain elevator. In 1896, the company experimented with water walls, which were similar to modern day sprinkler systems. In 1910, a new concrete water tower was completed at the lower end of slip number one. This cylindrical structure, shown in the top photo, was built by the Piedmont Construction Company of Atlanta. It measured 187 feet tall, had a 100,000 gallon tank at the top, and a 60,000 gallon tank at the bottom. Both were filled by electric pumps. A much larger redevelopment was authorized by company directors in 1914. The existing slips simply could not keep up with growth, and most facilities were still constructed of wood. The 1914 development called for all new concrete and steel construction, the permanent closure of Musgrove Creek, improvements to River Street for better terminal access, and new modern concrete floodgates. It also required building over a portion of the old Philadelphia slip that had been extended on two previous occasions. The new facility was a massive redevelopment. Constructed across 20 acres, it included 17 railroad tracks, totaling two miles of trackage, and 11 and a half acres of freight sheds. A total of 355,000 cubic yards of material was removed to create a new slip with 26 feet of depth. Construction began on April 7, 1914. Personnel included J.A. Benham, superintendent in charge of construction, and J.G. Basinger of New York, who served as the designing and supervising engineer. John P. Pettyjohn of Lynchburg, Virginia, was charged with construction of the office building, and other firms were selected from various East Coast cities. The new facility formed a U-shape with large parallel brick warehouses and freight sheds on either side of the main slip and a headhouse or office building on the southwest end. Northbound sheds were on the west side and southbound sheds were on the east side. The freight sheds included over 3,000 tons of structural steel and were faced with brick 17 inches thick. The shed interiors were lit by skylights and clear story steel frame pivot windows. Four ships could be burst in the slip at one time. 
Ships could unload and then shift across the slip to receive new cargo. Each was also accessed by rail spurs. The office building, or headhouse, was constructed of concrete and steel and was first occupied in October 1915. It included a passenger terminal, ticket office, baggage rooms, as well as lockers, showers, and baths for the employees. The two-story structure was faced with brick. Since it was designed to express the importance of the company, it had a lot of architectural detail. It had concrete window sills and lentils, brick corbeling within each of the double-height bays on the facade, and decorative dental work at the roof line. Upon entering the building, the vestibule was flanked by the ticket office on one side and the baggage room on the other. The stairwell contained a skylight and led to second floor waiting rooms, which were segregated by race. At the rear of the building, steel promenades were suspended over the tracks. This was designed to keep passengers away from the wagons and hand trucks that were handling cargo. The new terminal facility was fully operational in January of 1916, and the first outbound steamers left for New York and Boston on June the 5th. The new facilities included over 7,500 linear feet of wharfage, over 637,000 square feet of covered cargo space, and 375,000 square feet of fully enclosed cargo space. Arriving ships docked at the southbound freight shed. For local deliveries, they arrived at the city delivery shed. The southbound shed included over 166,000 square feet, and the city delivery shed another 49,000 square feet. The track platforms and delivery shed were reached by counterweighted steel bridges that could pivot and be raised and lowered in place. Electric cargo hoists were staged on the bulkhead platforms for unloading. Outbound ships were docked along the northbound freight shed, with freight received from as many as 100 cars which were placed in a sawtooth pattern. The floors were designed with a slight decline to take advantage of gravity in moving cargo. Terminals were equipped with movable drops and discharging berths with escalators and electric trucks. Storage facilities were connected by paved roadways and plank trucking platforms. Electric motor trucks were used to transport cargo between warehouses and platforms. Cranes were used to hoist materials to and from the ships. Berths were capable of handling bulk quantities of iron and steel, cotton, coal, merchandise, fertilizer, molasses, and creosote oil. At the time of its completion, the company declared, quote, the million-dollar terminal comprises the most modern and up-to-date coast-wise pier on the Atlantic coast. During World War I, two of the company's ships were commandeered by the government and used to carry supplies and personnel between New York and France. All ships were eventually adapted for military service or transport. Two ships were lost. One was sunk by a German U-boat, and another was destroyed in an accidental explosion. By the 1920s, the company's prospects were impacted by disruptions in regional agriculture. The boll weevil damaged the South's cotton crop, which was the company's principal cargo. Decades of exploiting the South's virgin timberland impacted the naval stores industry. Finally, the evolution of the automobile industry, along with improved highways, offered a new mode of transportation for leisure, business, and industry travel. As a result, passenger and cargo service declined. Cargo service alone dropped by over 100,000 annual tons during the 1920s. The company eventually cut its service to Boston and also sold several ships. Between 1922 and 1930, the company's annual net income dropped from over $900,000 to just over $100,000. During the 1930s, passenger and cargo service further declined due to the Great Depression. During World War II, the U.S. government requisitioned all of the company's ships, two of which were sunk by German U-boats. Those that did survive the war were sold to the U.S. government because they were not fit for reconditioning. During the war, the military also had priority over the port facilities, which greatly impacted trade. In the post-war period, many shipping companies struggled with the cost to restore services, which included financing new ships, reconditioning old vessels, and the cost of fuel, crews, and the maintenance of wharves. 
trucks were used on an ever-expanding highway system, and this also ate into maritime terminal operations. In the late 1940s, the Ocean Steamship Company assessed the feasibility of continued operations. A private consultant recommended liquidation of the company's remaining assets. In the early 1950s, the last cargo vessels were sold, and the old Philadelphia slip was abandoned. The steamship terminal facilities, now managed by the Smith & Kelly Company, were mostly used for international trade. Despite its poor finances, the Ocean Steamship Company had developed substantial infrastructure along the western Savannah waterfront. In 1945, the Georgia Ports Authority was formed and began reviewing ways to improve the Port of Savannah. By this time, the city of Savannah ranked fifth among southern ports, behind Mobile, Jacksonville, Charleston, and Wilmington. The Ports Authority proposed a 20-year, $20 $25 million development plan. This would include modernized facilities, reclamation of lowlands, and new waterborne industry further up the shoreline. The Ports Authority purchased the former Whitehall Plantation upriver and much of the central of Georgia's infrastructure. But the key to its redevelopment was the Ocean Steamship property, which one newspaper called the pride and joy of Savannah's waterfront. The Ports Authority finally purchased the property in 1958 for $2.8 million, ending the Ocean Steamship Company's 86-year history. Since that time, the Ports Authority has continued to expand the original terminal area with regular redesigns and expansion. The latest set of plans has removed the last remaining Ocean Steamship Company structures, the Head House and the Water Tower. But these changes simply represent a recurring chapter of improvements at the terminal, which has faithfully served the Port of Savannah since 1872. This presentation was prepared as a mitigation measure and partial fulfillment of the Georgia Ports Authority's cultural resource management obligations related to the demolition of historic buildings for the industrial redevelopment of its ocean terminal property in Savannah. This work was performed under the direction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Savannah District, and in consultation with the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office.